Okay, let's continue to look at trig functions as it relates to right triangles. Let me just make up a triangle problem and show you how oftentimes you will end up using your calculator. But then after that, I'm going to show you that in trig, a lot of times we don't like to use our calculators and we do some special things. So let me first start. I'm going to have a right triangle. And here's going to be an example of how trig functions can help us to determine the lengths of the sides of a right triangle. Right triangle. I'm going to just go up here. I'm going to define this angle up here. And I'm going to call it, even though the picture name may not be correct, I'm going to call it a 29 degree angle. And just for fun, I'm going to call, I'm going to decide the length of this bottom side of the right triangles four. And we'll call the length of this side A and we'll call this side C. And basically, I want to determine the lengths of the two sides of the triangle that are not defined. And the great thing is now we can use trig functions to figure out the sides of this triangle. Let's do A first. What I have to look at is here's the angle I know. I'm trying to figure out A in relationship to this angle A is like the adjacent side, right? We talked about that. Turns out C is like hypotenuse. And if we're looking at this 29 degree angle, four is like the opposite side. What I want to do is, since I know the length of this bottom side is four, and I have my angle here, I want to choose the trig function that uses the 29 degree angle, that uses the side I already know, which is this bottom side, which I'm calling the opposite side, and then I want to figure out the adjacent side A. So in a sense, I'm going to use the 29 degree angle this bottom side that's a length of four, and then somehow figure out this side A. So if I look at it, I've got an angle, I've got opposite, and I've got adjacent. Now of the, tri of the three trig functions, which of them relates the opposite and the adjacent? Well, it's so, ka, Toa. It looks like the tangent is the trig function that relates the opposite side with the adjacent side. So I'm going to write the tangent and apply it to this 29 degree angle. So I say the tangent of 29 degrees. Remember, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So the opposite is four and the adjacent is A. Now if you look at this, I only have one variable in this equation. I can now solve for A. So I can determine the length of side A. If you do a little bit, a little bit of algebra, you realize you end up with A equals four over the tangent of 29 degrees. Now this is a case in class, sometimes we talk about exact answers. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my calculator and figure out the side A. This is not going to be an exact answer because I'm pretty sure when I use my calculator, this number for A is gonna have lots of point, lots of numbers after the decimal. 
I'm going to have to round it off. So I grab my calculator, and there's all kinds of calculators, but if you have a scientific calculator, you should see on there, you'll have some keys, the sine key, the cosine and tangent. don't know if you can see it here. Here's a pretty typical. So if I set this down here, maybe you can see me do it. The way this calculator works is I'm going to do the tangent of 29 degrees first. First, I'm going to turn it on. Now, here's a key point when you're doing math with trig. You have to make sure of what mode you're in. By that, I mean the angle. Sometimes we work with angles and degrees, and sometimes we work with angle and radians. Here, my angle is in degrees. I've got to make sure I'm in the degree mode. And in this case, maybe you can't see it right up near the zero. It says DEG for degrees. So my calculator is in the degree mode. So I'm going to enter 29. That's my angle, 29 degrees. And then you can see here is my tangent key. So I hit the tangent key. So the tangent of 29 degrees is 0 0.55430, whatever. Now since that goes in the bottom of my fraction, my calculator has a little key that will take that number and stick it in the bottom. It's just 1 over x key. Your calculator may be different than mine, but this is how I'm going to do it. I hit the 1 over x key, and now I'm going to multiply that by 4. So A, I'm going to round off just to one digit. A should be a length of 7.2. Now my picture is not drawn correctly because obviously A is bigger than 4. But anyways, I've determined A is 7.2. Now let's go calculate C. Now, even though my picture up here is getting sort of messy, let's look at what I know. Now, here I have a choice because I'm trying to figure out my hypotenuse, and here's my angle. I can use, let's use the opposite side again. I could use the adjacent, but let's use the opposite side. What trig function relates the hypotenuse to the opposite side? Well, isn't that the sine, so katoa? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So I can now write the sine of 29 degrees equals opposite, and we're calling the hypotenuse C. So now if I solve this equation for C, I have C equals 4 over the sine of 29 degrees. And then I'm going to grab my calculator and do the same kind of thing I just did. 29, I'm going to take the sine, I'm going to put it in the denominator, multiply it by 4, 8.3. So I've decided the hypotenuse is 8.3. So that's a way where, in this case, we were given a right triangle. We were given one of the angles and the length, the length of one of the sides. And from just that information, we were able to determine the lengths of the other sides of the triangle. And of course, I could figure out this angle here, if it's 90 and 29, I can take 180 minus 90 minus 29, just for fun if I wanted to, I could have figured out this is a 61 degree angle. And I know everything about that right triangle. But the key is the way I was able to determine the lengths of the sides that I didn't know was by using these trig functions. Now here's something that they're going to do in trig. In this case, I just picked a random 29 degree angle and we used trig functions. I had to use my calculator, but I was able to calculate the things I wanted to know. In trig, here's what they like to do. 
They like to use what I like to call special angles. It's almost like in trigonometry, they want to do some problems and they don't want to have to keep grabbing their calculators and stuff. So they're going to choose some special angles and it's almost like we're going to memorize the trig functions of these special angles and then we're going to use them over and over and over again. All right, that may not make sense right now, but trust me, when I give you these special angles for the rest of this class, we're going to be seeing them over and over and over again. And there are really three special angles. We like to use a 30 degree angle and then a 45 degree angle and then a 60 degree angle. Those are what I call the three special angles. Now these are all what we call acute angles. I didn't mention that. An acute angle means an angle that's less than 90 degrees. <clears throat> so these three special angles are all acute angles. And as it turns out, I'm not going to do it here, but if you grab your textbook or go online and look, you can see that with some special math, they went ahead and they tried and they were able to determine the trig functions of these special angles. I'm not going to show you how they got that. I'm just going to go ahead and give you the trig functions. But once we learn these trig functions, we're going to use them over and over again. Now here's an easy way to remember them. And once again, the key ones are the sine and cosine. So I'm only going to focus on what are the sine and cosine of these three angles. I'm going to start with the sine. So here's a little way, an easy way to remember them, to memorize them. So I've got three angles. I'm going to start with the small angle, and I'm not looking at the sine, so I'm going to write sine of 30 degrees. And then the next angle is a sine of 45 degrees. And the next angle is the sine of 60 degrees. Now, what do these equal? In other words, I could simply grab my calculator and punch in the sine of 30 and punch in the sine of 45 and punch in the sine of 60. Now the one thing my calculator is going to do, at least mine, because it's not super sophisticated, it's going to give me a decimal answer. So if some of these are not exact nice numbers, it's going to give me a long answer with decimals. But what we're going to do here is we're going to actually try and get what we call exact answers. And I'll explain that again when we finish this up. Anyway, so here's what we do. First of all, I'm going to write all three of these as fractions. And the denominator is going to be the same for all three of them. And as it turns out, in the numerator, I'm going to first put sort of an empty square root. So I do the same thing for all three. The only thing I have to do is figure out what numbers to put underneath each of these square roots, and it's pretty simple. You start with one, then you put a two, and then you put a three. Of course, for the sine of 30, square root of one is one, so I just write this one half. Sine of 45 degrees is square root of two over two, Sine of 60 degrees is square root of 3 over 2. So these are the three sine functions for these three special angles. If you're ever needing to take the sine of a 30 degree angle, you know right away you've memorized it's one half. You don't have to grab your calculator, you just know it. If you ever have a problem where you're taking the sine of a 45 degree angle, you don't want to grab your calculator. This is called an exact answer. When you have a square root, it's an exact answer. If I grabbed my calculator and I took the sine of 45 degrees, I'll just show you what it is. 
for my calculator, now your calculator might be fancier than mine, but mine, I don't have a choice. If I put in 45 and hit the sign key, you know what I get? Some big long decimal. So if I were to write down that answer, I would probably write 0 0.707, and then I have to throw away or get rid of all the rest of these numbers. That's why it would not be considered an exact number. However, if I leave it like this, greater 2 over 2, that is considered an exact answer. So I'm going to leave it greater 2 over 2, and the same thing with the sine of 60 greater 3 over 2. So there's the signs of the three special angles. How about the cosine of those three special angles? Well, it's very similar, except you sort of do the opposite. And by that I mean, instead of starting with a small angle, when we do the cosine, we start with the big angle. Of course, 45 degree angle is still the middle angle. And then I write the cosine of the small angle, which is cosine of 30. I do the same thing. I'm going to have three fractions. Two is going to be in the denominator of these three fractions. And they're all going to have a square root. And in this case, since I wrote 60, 45, and 30, I still can do the one, two, three. Square root of one over two, of course, is going to be one half. Square root of two over two, square root of three over two. So that's a quick way to easily sort of remember initially what the sines and what the cosines of these special angles are. So how does that relate? Well, here's how it relates. How about we take another right triangle and we try and do a problem. Except for this right triangle, we're going to have one of our special angles. And when we solve this right triangle, the instructions told us to give an exact answer. That means the answer is not going to be some kind of decimal where you have to throw away some of the numbers to the right of the decimal. They want an exact answer, which means more than likely there's going to be some a square root in the answer. So here's a right triangle. I'll say this angle down here, even though, once again, when I draw these pictures, I'm sure the, the triangles are not quite right, but we're working on the math. I'm not trying to draw the most accurate pictures. I'm going to say that's a 60 degree angle. I'm going to say in this case, we know the length of the hypotenuse, which is 10. And then here are the two sides of the triangle that we don't know, but we want to figure out. What does A equal and what does B equal? So now, just like we did previously, Let's figure out A first. I know the hypotenuse, and here's my angle. What is A in relationship to this angle? A is the opposite. So I know the hypotenuse. A is my opposite side to my angle. What trig function should I use? I want to use opposite and hypotenuse. So katoa. So, sine, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So I can say the sine of 60 degrees is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So now here's an equation that I can solve for A. If I do a little algebra, I'll say A equals 10 times the sine of 60 degrees. Since I want an exact answer, I'm not going to go grab my calculator and return some decibel number for the sine of 60. This is one of my special angles, and up here I just wrote it, and at some point you'll very quickly have it memorized. 
And you remember that the sine of 60 degrees is square root of 3 over 2. So I'm going to say it's 10 times the square root of 3 over 2. 10 over 2 reduces on to 5. So I can say side A as an exact answer is 5 times the square root of 3. Let's figure out B. So I have to see, I'm looking for B. I'm going to use my hypotenuse again. So I know the hypotenuse is 10. Here's my angle 60. B, as it relates to the angle 60, what is B? B is the adjacent side. So now I have to think, what's the trig function that relates the adjacent side and the hypotenuse? So ka toa, ka, ka is adjacent over hypotenuse. So therefore I can say the cosine of 60 degrees adjacent, which is B over the hypotenuse 10. So if I solve for B, I'd have B equals 10 times cosine of 60 degrees. Once again, 60 degrees is one of my special angles. I'm not going to grab my calculator. I'm just going to say to myself, what is a cosine of 60? And then I remember it's 1 half. So 10 times 1 half, which is 5. So it turns out side B would be 5. So that's an example of solving a right triangle that has a special angle and therefore we can get exact answers. I'll just do one more very quick example since I've already written it down. We'll go through this very quickly. Once again, this is going to be a right triangle with a special angle. I'll do it up here. Let's say that angle is a 45 degree angle. I'm going to say the bot. oh, let's do something different. We haven't done this side yet. Let's say this side over here is seven. We'll call the hypotenuse C. We'll call this side A. So we want to use trig functions to determine the length of A and the length of C. Now I'm going to go through this pretty fast because hopefully you're getting the hang of this now. If I'm looking for A, according to this angle, A is the opposite side and I know my adjacent side. So what's a trig function that relates the opposite side and the adjacent side? So called TOA. Seems like it's tangent. So the tangent of 45 degrees is going to be it's opposite over adjacent. Opposites A, adjacent 7. So A is going to be 7 times the tangent of 45 degrees. Now, 45 degrees is one of my special angles. Now, what's interesting is when we sort of looked at how to memorize those special angles, we did not go over the tangent. We did the sine and the cosine. Well, the nice thing is that because we know the tangent of a 45-degree angle is always the sine of a 45 degree angle over the cosine of a 45 degree angle. We know the sine and the cosine of my special angles. The sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. The cosine of 45 is actually the same thing, square root of 2 over 2. So it turns out the tangent of 45 is 1. 
So we have 7 times 1, and it's actually 7. Now for C, C is that hypotenuse. Let's go ahead and use this adjacent side again. So what trig function relates the adjacent side and the hypotenuse? So ka, I think it's going to be the cosine. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Now if I solve for C here, C is going to be 7 over cosine of 45 degrees. Cosine of 45 degrees is one of my special angles. So 7 over square root of 2 over 2. And if we simplify this, it turns out it's 14 over square root of 2. And also, one nice thing about trig, previously in math, you were normally taught you never leave a square root in the denominator of a fraction of your final answer. Once we get to trig, it's no problem. We can just leave it there. Now, sometimes people still like to get rid of it, so you might, in some books, see a different answer. Of course, you remember how to rationalize the denominator, right? Multiply the top and the bottom by the identical square root. So this would be 14 square root of 2 over 2, which would be 7 square root of 2. Both these answers are the same, but for us, we could just stop here. We don't have to always rationalize the denominator. All right, so that's how we start to use trig functions to work with right triangles.